Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much for the invitation today, Stefano. Um, I am really glad to be in the company of so many uh, people who make such interesting work. Um, when you asked me to talk about the topic of the panel, uh, the way I'm going to very, very briefly talk about it is in the context of my own work, because that's the way that I think through these things. And I just wanted to, I have lost the, I'm sorry, my internet connection here this morning is quite bad. And I lost it. I dropped out of the, the, the meeting for a second, but I want to just throw some links um, in the chat. So if people want to later, they can, they can follow up what I'm about to talk about. Um, I've put links to four different things in the chat. Um, the first is a project that I did in 2018 called Ultra Chunk. For this project, I had to make a data set. And I suppose this is the lens that I think about ethics through at the moment is how do we make data sets to train um, machine learning algorithms on? So for Ultra Chunk, it was a project where the data set was me. So the ethics of it were fairly simple and that I decided I was happy to sign up for this project. And I made a year's worth of recordings of myself improvising using the webcam on my laptop. But afterwards, it was a strange feeling to think that I had given over my autonomy to this data set. Um, it's a project that generates video and audio of me performing. And it's a project that can either run in uh, combination with me or it can run autonomously. So I had created this data set that could run without my presence, without me even being alive. And that's something that I've had to think about over the last couple of years ethically. Like, what does that mean even for me as a composer? Um, in the project, a late anthology of early music, um, I used two different data sets. I used a data set uh, that Databots uh, kindly helped me create, which was a huge corpus um, of uh, recordings from sample RNN that had been trained on my voice. But the second data set was early Western music. And while the youngest composer that I used in that data set was Palestrina, so he died in 1594, quite a long time ago, um, I was more concerned with the idea of how Western music has established a canon, how Western music has excluded composers or marginalized composers from the canon. So the project is really a decolonization project, or I might even say a recolonization project in, in, a, new imaginary, uh, uh, in a new imaginary way. But I had to come to terms with how, you know, what it means to use the music of other composers, what it means, again, to use the music of my, uh, to use my own voice. The last project that I've put up there is text score data set. Now, that's a project that I really had to think about ethically what it meant to gather the material for it. Um, I created a data set. It's not publicly available. Um, it has over three and a half thousand text scores in it. And by text scores, I mean short text um, scores. So basically, we begin with Fluxus era. So there's George Brecht, Yoko Ono, Miyoko Chiomi, Ben Patterson, and we come right through to today. When I made that project, and it took a long time to put together because um, finding all these little text scores took a long time. Um, when we launched it in 2021, I was very aware of the fact that I could not release the data set anywhere because I would have committed about three, three and a half thousand counts of copyright infringement because there were three and a half thousand uh, text scores in this project. But what's really notable to me is on June 28th of this year, the UK government released their uh, response to a consultation that they did about artificial intelligence and intellectual copyright. I'm not going to go through the entire um, the entire statement that they gave, but they're currently drafting legislation in the UK that will mean it is completely legal for artificial intelligence researchers to take any data set of material they want off the Internet and use it for training, which means a lot of the ethical points that we're trying to discuss in this topic are irrelevant now because it, it is completely legal for an AI company, it will be completely legal for an AI company to take every single piece of music that they can scrape off Spotify and use it to train an algorithm on, and they won't owe those artists anything. There will be no compensation or no royalties to be paid. So I'm aware of the fact that though I would have committed copyright infringement when I put the tech score data set together, by the time the legislation comes through, 
that will not be, I won't be in copyright infringement anymore. So these are the things that I'm trying to think through in my work, what they mean. Thanks very much. My name is Hideki Nakaza. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm the president of um, AIARG, uh, that is Artificial Intelligence, Art and Aesthetics Research Group. And um, my uh, research is um, not only machine learning, because machine learning is, I think, um, part of AI, and um, machine learning process is kind of bottom up, but a top down process is also important. And um, for example, in the field of contemporary music, uh, Pierre Boulez uh, once strongly advocated total serialism. Uh, these top down events do not occur with current machine learning AI. Uh, the concept of AI is not only machine learning in, the, in nature. Um, it would probably be more interesting um, and um, to think of AI development that presents people with a sense of self-consciousness and aesthetics in a top-down manner. But uh, nowadays, um, AI is only on machine learning. Um, that is. Thank you. Forgive me in advance if I have any brain farts. It's 4 a.m. here and um, I'm teaching later on today. So <laughs> I'm definitely um, in a, in a, not out of my depth, but, but in a new kind of space. Um, so just in terms of my work, I find myself in this, this work through my um, career as a rapper and producer. Um, I have recently begun working with a women of color led game studio um, and as part of that endeavor have been thinking about the creation of avatars within game spaces who can perform hip hop uh, and uh, specifically thinking about rap lyricism and performance and production. Um, there are a lot of questions around cultural appropriation that have arisen in that project for myself, specifically thinking through questions of who's doing the rapping in these particular spaces, um, what kind of language will be allowed to be utilized in the game, um, is it possible to create a rapper from nowhere, um, would we even want to create a rapper from nowhere, thinking about the, the importance of the hyperlocal and identity and carving out what hip hop is as a, a cultural force. Um, and then specifically ludic questions around what does it mean to win in rap composition and performance? Um, if we're thinking about this in a gaming context, what are some of those implications around creativity? Um, if we're engaging with ideas of winning and losing, um, and then finally, is it possible to reconcile this space between um, rap as it's read and rap as it's sounded, um, which I think emerges in, in um, specifically in this kind of game performance environment. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. I'm definitely not an expert. I think this is, this is mostly my curiosities that have led me here. So I'm really excited to, to listen and share where I might be of value. Thank you. So thank you very much for the in invitation and for the introduction. Um, I would like to formulate three plus one hypotheses with hypothesis one, two, and three falling into the field of discussion and hypothesis four belonging more to the field of speculation. Hypothesis one, Artificial neural networks will not only be able to compose perfectly in any style, but will also be able to generate an infinite number of genuinely new musical works with the help of style ambiguity discriminators. Now, Tokui had talked about this in his keynote yesterday. Hypothesis two, this will create an abundance economy for music with the consequence that there will be a social devaluation of this form of musical creativity. In the not too distant future, billions of AIs will write trillions of new music pieces in which the decisive point of comparison for judging newness and creativity will disappear. With Hegel, one could speak here of a bad infinity. 
Hypothesis three, AI artists such as Memo Acton, Helen Azarin, and Mario Klingemann circumvent this problem by working concept-based. That is by formulating concepts that provide a framework for the reception of AI art. In this sense, AI music with a strong claim to creativity is also likely to become concept-based AI music. Hypothesis four. Theoretically, the problem of bad infinity could also be fixed with the development of general artificial intelligence, which would be able to generate new links between images, respectively sounds and concepts. But if one looks at the most surprising and creative achievements in contemporary art, such as Maurizio Catalan's installation in the ninth hour where a Pope figure is struck by a meteorite, then one needs a special kind of discriminator, namely the human subject with its individual life experiences, which recognizes such unique synthesis of meaning in itself as meaningful. If an AGI is to produce such synthesis of meaning, then it would have to lead a human-like existence itself and live and communicate as a human among humans. The AI would have to be able to subjectify itself, so to speak. The question would be, however, whether one can then still speak meaningfully of an artificial intelligence. So that was my more have been my four thesis, and I will put in the uh, in the comments uh, two lectures which are where I developed in relation to visual arts and to music this idea idea of subjective uh, subjectified AI. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, I feel honored to be in this world with all these great artists and professors. Um, so I think what resonated with me most, uh, even from before, even up to now, was what Jennifer uh, talked about regarding the data sets. So I think the like the algorithms that we're using are generally fairly transparent, and the, the data sets are the ones that then we import certain bias upon them. And these are with the ethical questions tend to come on. And for our work at Cosmo, or at least me personally, I don't find talking about the uh, AI model, like we've seen the recent image models as interested in trying to fix the bias within these data sets as much as the work we're trying to do here at Cosmo with um, putting these tools into the hands of artists where they can gather their own data sets and train their own models and present their own viewpoints using them, not only as a tool that's already being pre-trained so they can take off the shelf and use the things to grow with their own uh, biases, which also give these algorithms a kind of personality in the end. Um, and also, the thing that Harry just talked about with uh, music being generated infinitely is something I was thinking about since I've seen it has already happened for a few years on platforms like Spotify, let's say there are um, blog posts from even back when it was Echoist before Spotify where they're talking about how they are trying to uh, prevent musical spam. Of like people that keep uploading different iterations of songs. This was happening even before an AI could do this automatically. There were just people generating these things and trying to upload them to get the downloads and the views to generate money. Right. But, uh, it's first of all, it's hard to find them. And then they generate the feedback loop upon themselves, which could mean that we have only a narrow set of things if they become part of the data set later on. Um, but also um, the same tools that are used to generate them could be the ones that help us remove them in the first place, because then, as long as they can be generated, it should be able to be removable. And they could be able to find, let's say, for example, the root song, if such a thing exists. Right? Like, where did this idea originally come from? Who was the original author? And this could be traced back automatically.
thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss those really interesting topics. So personally, I'm from the visual generative uh, side of things and I'm really interested and I've been doing recently a lot of what is called long form generative art pieces. That is the art piece is not the individual output themselves, but just the algorithm that is able to generate a bunch of uh, different outputs. So you have this idea that is, it's just not only one single output that is meaningful, but the, the meta level, that is how diverse you can create a piece or how meaningful the piece will look at the scale of a collection and not just at, at just one individual piece. And I'm really interested in, in this idea of if we push the concept a little bit further and we are able to have those systems that are able to generate as the previous speakers have been saying, uh, we can then create content that might be only meaningful to one individual. And, th and that's something that I think is not really being explored right now in, in the sense that um, most of the, the systems that are based on huge data sets will by definition be an average of everything that is happening and we are lacking this individuality of the contents. And I, I'm sure there is a lot of opportunity to be able to tailor the output of generative systems so that it really means something just to you and not to the people that is that are next to you. And, and then we will discuss about this idea of, have you heard the latest meta album of whatever creator is there? Because they will be able to generate a generator of sort so they will the content will be the generator that will be able to output the piece of music that is fit for you and not for everybody else and i think that this this shift will happen sooner than later because the technology is there and as uh, we're saying the industry for uh, individualized content is booming and so those ideas are what really motivate me in the term in the sense that I cheat a lot because I'm using visuals, so it's faster to check if everything is okay. So I can, uh, the discussion we have in the in the visual community are slightly different from the one that are exist in the in the music community because the this idea of immediate feedback uh, allows uh, the the systems to grow faster. So my my stance is really about what is the next level of content creation when we have two systems that are able to create something that is meaningful just for one unique individual. Well, if I can continue, I guess the the it's it's if we accept this idea of having those meta content generators, then the answer is no. It will be uh, on the contrary, a, a new dimension of <laughs> new content that will be um, appearing because people will react to the like not the dullness of what can be extracted from current generators, but they want to push the contents so that it's, it starts to sound better and different all the time. So I guess this, this need to create something that stands out will out outperform the average output that will come out of, of, of those basic systems. Uh, I have a question to Hideki, uh, Hideki uh, Nakazawa. You talked about Boulez, and uh, I thought that's very interesting. And did I understand you right? You said that because um, in serialism there are no patterns, so that's why uh, deep learning systems which recognize patterns cannot create serialism in music. Uh, so this is right, yes? Yes. Did I understand you right? Uh -huh. Kind of totalitarianism, um, such as uh, not um, um, people who dislike the serialism is ism, and such a ism of uh, music um, theory uh, cannot be found by uh, machine learning, I think. And then my next question would be. Yes. Uh, isn't it possible? Uh -huh. um, so, if so, yesterday we heard about uh, uh, the dis the uh, um, style ambiguity discriminator. Uh, couldn't you develop something similarly 
to the to 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 find out uh, this style of serialism which has no patterns is this totally impossible so that the system recognizes and learns to find out music which uh, has in the most significant way um, is in a way accidentally also the, where the musical parameters are absolutely uh, contingent. Mm -hmm. um, so, the question is um, evaluate function and if evaluate function is always made by humans so that is not so interesting but if uh, AI itself or himself or herself um, make his or her or its evaluative function itself, um, something will happen, I think. But uh, nowadays, uh, AI is using all, uh, only the evaluated, evaluative function is by human, human decides nowadays. Artificial consciousness is very important to uh, develop such things. And uh, nowadays, uh, technology not yet uh, coming so. But consciousness cannot be defined. So that is very the, uh, exactly the uh, hard problem, I think. Um, if possible, I hope this doesn't derail things too much. I, I wanted to, there's a, a question in the chat that I thought was interesting that I um, wanted to engage around um, how tools are kind of co-opted and, and what that looks like. And, um, in my mind, so the question there says AI is a tool, like a piano is a tool. Did the invention of the piano lead to a homogenization of music as you see AI doing so? And it strikes me that there's a question of scale here and um, the ability for a lot of the tools that it sounds like you're describing to proliferate very quickly, extremely quickly to wide populations, to wide groups of, of users. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I wanted to ask for some of the artists that are here in this space is who do you see as using the tools that you're designing or drawing from um, some of the libraries that you're building? Like who I, I I'm hearing this conversation about these becoming more ubiquitous, um, but I would be curious about who you're thinking about as the user in this space. I, I, I think your point is very interesting. I don't make the tools um, because I'm not a, I'm not a coder, but maybe I suppose I could sort of think alongside you, if this makes sense, uh, Anongo, in that, um, where one of the the spaces that I see this most actively being discussed and and sort of dealt with is actually in the text to image generation space, and I've spent a lot of time um, with Dolly and Mid Journey and systems like that. And what's really notable to me is these systems are not the same. It's not the same piano <laughs> across each of these systems. They're very, very different. They're much more like sort of bespoke synthesizers, which maybe collect, connects with what Alexis is talking about, this idea of this bespoke experience. Um, Dolly is very interesting and fascinating and amazing. <laughs> um, but the experience of using Mid Journey is very, very different because it was designed to be social. It was designed to be a community experience. And when you're on a Mid Journey channel uh, on Discord, you're seeing people all around you generating images and you're seeing people generating llama, unicorn, rainbows. And then there's always somebody generating a woman in a tiny bikini. It's always a tiny bikini, you know? So immediately you're plunged into the world. You're plunged into all these issues to do with ethics. Um, I was in a channel the other day and somebody kept uploading an image of a real human woman trying to base the images that would be generated on her. And I found myself trying to Google reverse image search to find her to tell her that this was happening, you know, because it felt very strange to witness this. So I my feeling is that 
Mid Journey are on the right track in that by making it, you know, by making it be a communal experience, you're having to see what everybody else around you is doing. And of course you can pay for private channels and, and, and I'm sure there's all sorts of stuff going on inside those, but there is something about the community experience that, that sort of urges people to try and caretake for one another and also makes the art better because everybody sees what everybody else is doing and gets tips. And there's a lot of huge discussions about is mid journey the same as the camera going on in the philosophy channels. And, and a lot of people are like, well, no, it's not because you know, the camera, the camera, you had to take it out. You had to point it at things rather than, than simply try to figure out how text prompt works. So I suppose my, my my um, background as a musician would love to see these tools used in a similar way communally where people are bouncing ideas off one another and trying things out because then I think some of what Alexis talks about will naturally happen people will say I don't want just another ambient ambient piece with drones and field recordings like I want something with ambient music and drone recordings and a bagpipe solo because then my piece will stick out and people will listen to it so that's what I would love to see if that makes sense get back to this idea of the piano the piano for me has been created as a way to for the composer to simulate full orchestra at the same time and have an idea how it would sound and at first it was designed as a way to imitate the full orchestra, but then it became an instrument by itself with people mastering the piano. But what happens is the orchestra is using just intonation most of the time, but they had to adapt themselves to the tuning of the piano. So then the music changed again because the piano became the master tool of uh, composition. And we will, I guess, see the same shift here where the those systems that will be able to create some new things at um, infinity will we'll in introduce the same shift in, in the way we compose and use those tools. Do we, will we have a live um, performance uh, with uh, a DJ like uh, Tokoi San is doing? Do we have something that goes to the next level where we'll have like the full orchestra that is playing with random AI agents at the same time. Um, so the shift of technology will allow for new creative endeavors. And I'm, I'm not worried about um, somehow losing so much because the piano can do any, everything. You cannot do a vibrato on the piano. It doesn't mean that violinists are not doing, doing vibratos anymore. We are still composing for those specific stuff. So, yeah. I, I would have a reply to Jennifer. Uh... So my, my argument in a way is that uh, it is not a, a problem at all because um, there are different kinds of creativity and what you uh, imagine so, uh, this, this other sense of um, AI art, uh, which is more communal, as you said, I think. Um, um, I think that AI artists already looking for such a type and creating already such a type of art, um, the uh, the possibilities to create. Um, uh, there are different kinds of creativity and different kinds of newness, and uh, there are, and artists will automatically go beyond what can create an an a weak AI at least now, and combine this uh, this images or sounds or pieces with with concepts so that would be my my, my idea I, I i'm interested what you saying to, in relation to this idea well it's a very it's a very interesting proposition i mean i think we are at the point where um as um i forgot the name of the presenter that did the, the speech just before our panel like the functional music and the production music might be done in the sense that if there's no special needs, we have enough uh, technology right now to be able to generate content for specific needs. And um, most people might be satisfied with that. The thing is we will lose this personal connection that we have with art. And that is not just meant as a uh, <coughs> consumer good. And I, I guess it's, it's, we will still have the same problem as ever. How do we express ourselves as artists if the music that we were um, 
kind of used to consume before doesn't have the same meaning because it's half generated or it's 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 coming from a different place and this need for expression and that is um related to culture this is related to how we will just shout our name in the space will will change as as a result of this and i think we see this individual art a little bit uh, faster as i said because of the feedback loop and everything everything goes a little bit faster individual uh, feedback loop um we have those styles that are coming out of visual artists and that's their their main output is the style and and the way their content is created at a wider range not just only the individual output music is slightly different because it takes time to to appreciate you don't you cannot listen to 100 songs at the same time it's it's a different um aesthetic uh, proposition that requires a different framework to work with but the need to express your personal feelings and have those feelings um actually touch someone even if the generation process is automated is still an open problem and whatever tool there is this is still what we want to do and I, I don't have the answer and i of course i don't have the answer because if we had the answer life would be very boring and i would like to really have those those tools like i want i have something that i want to say with this framework i can try i can listen if it makes sense to me then i, cr I can try to build on top of this would it make sense for me yes will it make sense to the audience i don't care that much because i'm not interested in the general audience I'm interested in how I will touch just you, right? So, so it's it's. I, I think we'll 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 have those um, like key epoch changing moments really soon. Even <coughs> already they already happened, and I'm just not aware of them. But but this idea that the content we're producing right now uh, has to change to the meta level of of having those meta content, uh, I guess is is really the, the the mind shift that we have to accept first so that we can still continue to express ourselves within this new medium. <laughs>